Okay, Mr. Mr. Duma is going to be here. Here he is. Welcome. Love you too. That was our kid. All right, Mr. Danny should be showing up any second here. There he is. All right. So, hey, while we're waiting, James, what's going on this week, man? How you been? Tell me anything, anything good? Praise reports? Prayer requests? Uh, it's been a slow week, I guess you'd say. Just a kind of average week. Average week? Yeah. I enjoyed Sunday service there at the church. That was a really good one. Yes, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow. You got, you know that I, I have a message prepared. I'm excited about it for tomorrow night. Yeah, you give me all those sneaky inferences to what was happening Wednesday. So I well, got to go to Tyler, but I, it's not I got to go to Tyler, but I'm leaving early and I'll be back in time. I should be unless something comes up I don't know about. So gotcha, gotcha. Well, uh, first off. Not to interrupt you, but Danny, how you doing, sir? Doing well. What's going on, family? Hey, how's there he is. How's the Danny family doing? Doing well. Doing well. I can't complain. Just good. Hey, walking in, walking in the blessing. Amen. Just, 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 just striving to, 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 to be all that we can be each and every day for the Lord. Always the light in the darkness, Danny. I love you, brother. Hey, Amen. Love you guys as well. We should have. I know Alicia's out. She had some uh, something she had to do with her job or something like that. Um, okay. So, yeah, they couldn't make it. Curtis might, but um, she said he might make it. Um, I'm not yeah. sure who else is going to join, but um, uh, I want to remind you. I want to. I want to say a prayer for um, my phone. Uh, for Pastor Troy had asked me about. Uh, let me see here. Let me go to my notes while I'm looking this up. Anybody have any prayers at all? Danny, need any prayer requests? Yeah, just continue to just, uh, you know, keep me lifted up in prayer. Okay. There it is right there. We sure will. Yep. Uh, real quick, Chase Purvis is his name. He's a, he got hurt in the oil field. He had an accident. And he has a brain bleed. Is somebody that Troy knows, and we need to pray for him as well as tomorrow. Oh. Chase Purvis, yeah. He was an oil field accident. He had a brain bleed. And I also want to pray for brother, my pastor here, Pastor Troy, um, he, as of right now, they're waiting to hear for the induction time for his daughter. They're having a, another grandchild. So he oh. will be uh, church tomorrow because of that. He's out, of, he's out of town, out of commission. So pray okay. for the birth of his grandchild. All right. Yeah. And, and that prayer that uh, for me is actually for me and Chris. Okay, you and Chris. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. Chris and I. Yeah. I'll write that down right now. I had to get that out before I forgot. That's all. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Danny and Chris. Got it. Hold on. And then. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, you guys done moved location that haven't you, Pastor John? Yeah, uh, yeah. Got well, so, you got a different background. So, we've done it out here a couple of times if we're on the road. Uh, my daughter, Madison's here, and um, she had a little medical procedure as well. So, we're helping her with, with her, with our grandchild. And oh, okay. So hanging here for a few days with the family. We're having a blast with them. And so, uh, my office is a bedroom right now, so I don't want to interrupt her flow and you know the baby sleeps and all that. Yeah. So. Yep, that's what <laughs> hey, that's what we do for our kids, man. Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> so we're out in the living room today. <laughs> yes, sir. Little John's here. If you want to say hi, little John, everybody, real quick. Come on in here real quick. You can say hi. There's little John. Hey, little John. Little John growing too, isn't he? He is. <laughs> hey, little John. He is, yes. Hey, little John. <laughs> so uh let's see what am i forgetting honey was it we're gonna say yeah. that's good Bubba. um so danny and chris uh pray for chase oh. pastor troy uh his grandchild oh. chelsea not feeling oh. too well and um just generally you know alicia's ongoing healing pray for that you don't have to mention it by name but i mean mm -hmm. um and just my kids my son my son all my kids they have new kids and they just need the favor of the father to keep them strong through childbearing. It's tough. So my son, Bear, and my, my daughter, Madison, and my other child and, need a prayer. And my my oldest is getting ready to fly to move to Italy on Friday. So wow. she'll be there with her husband for three years. And 
We gotta be careful not to bump our table. I forgot the cameras hooked the left. Sorry about so. that. Um, yeah, so a lot of prayer, nothing specific. We just need prayer for everybody. And, and um, there's too many to mention. Um, so yeah. So that being said, if somebody joins, they can join us later. Um, Y'all want to go ahead and get this thing fired up? It's wrong. Let's do it. Let's do it, baby. All right. Father, we just come before you, Lord, and we are just, we are thankful, Father God. We're thankful, Lord, for all that you do for us, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Father, for being my Savior, Lord, being our Father. Savior. Father, thank you, Father. Lord, for the gift that you've given us, Lord. I thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. That's our comforter, Father God. It gives us wisdom and direction and discernment lord sure. lord i just um i lift up tonight to you father god i ask lord that holy spirit that you would just be in this place lord lord yes. that you'd be in the homes of those who are are watching online and those who are joining us on facebook father god that your presence would just um supernaturally just surround them father god yes. Lord, that you would touch the hearts and minds of every every person, Father God, that's Thank with you, us Father. tonight, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Have your way. Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to that are open to receive from you, Father God. Lord, that we would put down anything that's not of you, Lord, tonight. Lord, every anything that has been um that has weighed heavy on our spirits, Lord, from um Please. this week, Lord, and um Lord that you know what each of those things are in each person's life, including ours, Lord. And we just ask, Father God, that you would just um, bring peace to the situations, Lord. And ask Lord, that you would, um, that we would just shake it off, Father God, and keep our eyes fixed and focused on you, Lord. That's right. I pray for a soft and hard as well, Father. Yes. Lord, I lift up um, Danny and Chris to you, Father God, I, I, I just ask, Lord, that you would just be with them, be a hedge of protection around them, Lord God, I lift up their relationship, Father God, that you would, um, that you would give them direction, Lord, that you would, um, just fill them up, renew them, Father God, give them wisdom, I pray for supernatural favor, Father God, I pray, Lord, that you would, um, continue to keep them on your straight, narrow path, Father God, thank you, Father. Lord, that they would continue to have a heart that burns passionately for you, Lord. Thank you, Father. And that you would keep that you would keep you in the center of their relationship, Father God. Lord, I lift up Chase um, Purvis to you, Father God. This this gentleman that we don't know, Father God, but you know who he is, Lord. Yes, Father. The actions that he had, Father God. I ask, Lord, for supernatural healing and a touch from you, Lord God. I pray that you would Amen. keep him where he's at in the hospital, Lord, with this, this brain bleed, Father God. I ask that you would supernaturally rest your hands Thank you, and your healing balm upon him, Father God, that we know that you can do all things, Lord, and that we know that you you are a worker of miracles, Father God. So we just call upon wow. you. We ask that you would stop this brain bleed, Father God. Thank you, Father. We ask, Lord, that you would supernaturally stop any brain swelling that takes place, Father God. I ask Thank for you. peace for the family, Lord. I ask for wisdom and direction from the doctors, Lord God. Thank you, Father. Lord, yes, I pray, Father God, that your presence would be felt in the hospital room, Lord God. Hallelujah. And Lord, that, um, that there'd be a miracle that takes place, Lord God, and that even the, the doctors, the hospital staff, the nurses, the Come janitor, on. everybody would... Would yeah, be yeah, yeah, yeah. You are king right. of kings and Lord of lords, Father no God. Thank you, Lord, for a miracle. Thank that you, you still do miracles today, Father God. And I pray a testimony would come out of it in Jesus' name. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Father God, I lift up um, Pastor Troy and Renee's um, daughter and their um, yes. grandchild that's about to come into this this um, this world, Father God. I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, this would be a just a, a the delivery, Lord, would go smoothly, Father God, that you would be uh, with their daughter, Lord, that you'd give her peace, Lord. Yes, God. That she would receive the um, the encouragement and the Come support on. that she needs, Lord God. I pray that you would touch the hands of the doctors that will lay their hands Glory upon this God. child that comes into the earth, Father. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this new, this new life that you're bringing forth, Father God. I pray a blessing over this baby in Jesus' mighty name. 
Lord, I lift up Chelsea to you, Father God. I know that she's not feeling well tonight. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name that you would stop these cramps yeah. from taking place, Lord God, that you would renew her body, soul, and spirit, Father God. I ask, Lord, that she'd be able to have her focus and um, her eyes fixed on you tonight, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father God. I pray a blessing over her and Kevin's marriage, Father God, and their family, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on. Lord, I pray, Lord, I just a renewed um, sense of intimacy within their marriage, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Father. Lord, I just... um. I lift up all of our children to you, Lord God. Um, yeah. Bear and Maddie to Maddie and Taylor, Lord, to Tira, yeah. Alea, Alyssa, Amariah, little John, Father God. Come on. Um, Amanda. Amanda, yeah. Lord Jesus. I just, um, Amanda and Matthew and, and Tira and, um, uh, Grant. and Grant, Lord God. I just, I just ask, Lord, that you would just bless my our children, Father God. I ask, Lord, that you would direct their steps, Father God. I ask, Lord, that your favor be poured out upon them, Father God, and that you would just light their hearts on fire for you, Lord. Thank you. Pray for my Lord, we just also lift up Buki to you, Lord God. I ask, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to her, Lord God, that you'd remove the blinders from her eyes, Father God. Yes, Father. Thank you, Father. I thank, thank you. Everyone for this time with my grains so yes sorry and lord is um and we also lift up all of our grandchildren that we have father god okay. yes lord that you would supernaturally bless them thank you we uh, pray for our church with our ministries going forward yes lord we lift up our our church family father god the thank ministries you. that we take place in thank God, ministries for our christian center yes lord and lord i just ask father god that um you would make my husband's tongue the tongue of a, a ready writer, Father God, that he it would be able to yes. write on the hearts That's of right. those, your people, Father God, and yeah. Lord, that, that your words would come forth out of his mouth, Lord God. Yes, Lord. Come on. Lord, I ask, Father God, that our hearts would be prepared to hear from you tonight, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. And that you would take your word and deposit it deep into come our hearts, on. Lord. It's going to be a good night. And we just thank you for all these awesome things, Lord. Thank you for this time and blessing. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on. Come on. Oh, it's about to be good tonight. All right. Do I say that every week? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's all right. Hey, that's, hey, hey. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try to calm down with my too many, like, hey, wait for it. Listen to this. You know, those words I always say. What's that word I always say? Like, watch this, watch this, watch what? this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, how how was it, everybody? Welcome, Danny. Welcome, uh, Brother James. I love you guys. Welcome. Good to have you here. We got a little congregation. No matter if we got two, three, or 300, right? That's right. Okay. So, listen, we are working our way through. We started through the book of John last year, and we're working our way all the way through uh, the book of Acts. We just completed mm -hmm. Acts chapter 22. On our way to 28, the finish line's near. All right. So uh, we finished up Acts chapter Acts chapter 23. Most of this half of the book is about Paul. Excuse me, we finished chapter 22. We're going to go into 23 tonight. But uh, basically, Acts chapter 22, we're still, we're seeing more of the same stuff. You know, Paul, Paul has went through a lot of persecution, and it's just gotten worse and worse as he's traveled closer to Rome. And so mm -hmm. there's already been lots of dissension. There's already been on more than one occasion, people, multiple people try to kill Paul just for proclaiming the gospel. Um, he hasn't even put down their gods. He's just proclaimed his own God and people don't like it. We found out last week that the word Gentile, like, oh, a Gentile could receive the gospel and be saved. And that didn't go over too well for Paul. So last week, Paul's still on this journey to Jerusalem, right? He's in Jerusalem. Um, I made some notes here. He's constantly reminded by the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit's warning him. It's not saying don't go, but he's like, hey, I want you to be aware that danger befalls you. Danger awaits you. Um, and so Paul, he, he um, one second. Sorry about that, guys. Um, my dog is going through my Our table. wires. All right. So Paul is... Uh, constantly reminded by the Holy Spirit, don't go because there's there's change and tribulation awaits you. He's warned by other people, don't go because it's dangerous. You're gonna you're gonna be killed. This has happened more than once. And so 
tonight there's more of that, but we're gonna we're gonna have some new information, um, some new information interjected this evening. And so y'all ready to go for this? I'm gonna kind of do a quick recite. Y'all, y'all digging it? You ready? Yeah. All, All right. right. So basically, Paul gets to Jerusalem, a riot breaks out. That's already happened. He's arrested by the commander of the I got I should have maybe hooked my camera to that thing. Um He's arrested. He's held by the, uh, the Antonio Fortress, which is planted right there in north of, in the Jerusalem Temple. That's where the Roman guards basically oversee the 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 whatever's happening in the temple. So um, there's a guy. He's arrested by a guy, commander by the name of Claudius Lysias. We heard about him already. Um, and so basically, uh, the crowd. He asks the crowd, why, "Why? You know, what has Paul done? You know, what's going on?" And and no one has a really good answer of what happened, what Paul has done to create this giant uproar. Is there, Paul's already been saved once and basically crowd surfed and he um, made it up to the steps of Jerusalem where the, the crowd calmed down and they were listening to him and he started preaching the gospel. So he was really excited about it until he said that, hey, Gentiles can make it in too. That didn't go over well. So another riot broke out. Same day, two and same day here. So there are all these different answers like, what did Paul do? And no one could answer. What what did he do? So um, this leader, this uh, Claudius Lysias, you know, they did something called scourging. We heard about scourging in the book of John. But basically, uh, it's a form of confession. They call it, um, um, there's a word for that. They, uh, where's the word? Where's the word? It doesn't matter. Um, he was basically scourged to get some answers. To, you know, <clears throat> this leader's like, Paul, what did you do? He's trying to get him to talk and, and find out what caused all this distress in, in the temple. Because we don't want, you know, Caesar to find out there's more trouble in the temple. So Claudius Lysias is not, not, not too excited about that. So he, he questions Paul and scourges him. So we read about that already. And so basically they found out Paul didn't really break any Roman laws or really any Jewish laws. It's just they had disagreements on what they believed, you know, what they believed. So no law was broken. So basically Claudius Lysias is kind of like, well, he finds out that, you know, we can't, we can't beat him. Because he's a Roman, you know, he's a Roman citizen. So it's like, we're going to want to go let the Sanhedrin handle this, <clears throat> since we really can't formally judge him for what he did, whatever that might be. And so Paul says, you know, you can't beat a Roman citizen. Paul tells him because he was, you know, Paul was a Pharisee. He knew the law. So Paul used his Roman citizenship to explain to the uh, to this to this um, Claudius Lysias that, hey, I can't be scourged. I can't be you know, you can't judge me that way. So basically the commander sends him to this, down to the Sanhedrin, which are the people that the Pharisees and Sadducees that on a local level level oversee the Jewish laws, you could say, even though Rome, um, um, the Roman leaders were over them, the Sanhedrin kind of handled their own Jewish laws. So he handed it down to the Sanhedrin to decide how they he'd be judged a lot like Jesus. Right. And so he hands them off to the Sanhedrin, and after Paul is given to them, he he asks, he addresses the crowd, same thing, the crowd's trying to kill him. He stands on a balcony of the Antonio Fortress, and he gives this testimony of how Jesus appeared. So he goes through the whole story of Acts chapter 9 when he goes to the road to Damascus. And so we heard in the last uh, chapter, we heard about his testimony, his defense. Acts 22 opens up where Paul is on the top of the um, Jerusalem on the steps, and he says, okay, Paul's giving a defense. So we heard this word, apologia, or apologetic response. So Paul gives his defense or his testimony about what happened to him, and he tries to explain to them in their Hebrew tongue, hey, I'm one of you, I'm, you know, calm down. I'm not against what you do. I'm not saying you can't practice your Jewish customs. I'm just trying to say Gentiles are allowed in. And so as I told you, he was good. They were listening until he mentioned the word Gentiles. So here he is again. Um, they freaked out again. So it, it was a second riot caused by, and this is chapter 22, caused by Paul. So the commander did not know what to do. So he brings him to Sanhedrin um, and to, to stand trial. Well, so in chapter 23, we're going to read how that did not go very well. And so here it is. They're handing it down to the Sanhedrin to let them figure out what he did wrong since they couldn't tell him what he did wrong. And so really, Paul has not broken any laws. They just want to kill him because he represents Jesus, plain and simple. 
but no one can find an actual reason to put him to death. Everybody with me so far? And so Acts 23 is him doing that very thing. It starts out in verse one. It says, and Paul earnestly beholding the council, the Sanhedrin, and we're going to talk, even though we've done this before, we're going to briefly talk about who they are and how they assemble. So he's beholding the council. He's looking at the council and said, men and brethren, which I think is really interesting that he starts out that way, men and brethren, because Paul used to be a Pharisee. So he's talking, like I said last time, to Pharisees and Sadducees. He called them men and brethren, not because they were Christians necessarily, but because he probably was among them at one time several, uh, several years ago. They were a part of his clan. So they were brothers to him, right? More mm -hmm. like fellow um, kinsmen. They're, in, yeah, they're yeah. Israelites. They're Hebrews. So they're Hebrew and he was, yeah. part of, he, was part of, he was part of them as a whole, whether or not they were a part of the Sanhedrin. Or just the Jewish people that he was, he called them brothers. Because remember, Paul used to be Saul. He was a good Jew. And so yeah. um, he didn't address them like he normally would. He said, men and brethren. And what's interesting is Peter in chapter four and Stephen in chapter seven uh, referred to them as elders and fathers as well. So Paul says, men, brethren, because Paul was a Pharisee. Um, we're going to find out Acts 26 will allude to Paul being a Sanhedrin leader. I know I've said that he was, and we haven't really been given an absolute that he was a Sanhedrin leader, but when we get to Acts 26, it will outline that he was a leader in the Sanhedrin, by the way, okay? So they could have been classmates under Gamaliel when they were being taught. So he obviously knew these guys. So in verse one, it says, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. So Paul's saying, I did nothing wrong in the Temple Mount, all right? He did nothing wrong. So Paul speaks of his conscience. I'm going to tell you this. Paul speaks from his conscience 23 times in his letter that he writes. Um, his internal moral compass was important to him. Okay, so he points it out a lot. And verse 2 says, And the high priest Ananias, this is not Annas, but it's Ananias, the commander commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth, to hit him across the mouth. Okay. So the high priest Ananias commanded him to hit him across the mouth. So if you guys are taking notes, let me go ahead and uh, let mom in real quick. I don't know how many of you like the details, but if you do, this is what our Bible study is about. Do you guys like these extra details? Mm -hmm. Good. So mom, if you can hear me, I know you're logging in. Welcome. I love you. So this high priest Ananias, let's talk about him briefly. He served as a high priest in A.D. 47, okay? And he served until the first Jewish revolt, which was in A.D. 66, that ended in A.D. 70. So that's when he served. This is when the Romans came in. They destroyed the temple, if you remember that. The Romans didn't uh, kill Ananias, but the Jews did. So he, he misused the temple money, right? So he, I'm not going to get into that too much. Um, and so I'm going to read, I'm going to go ahead and have Alana read this. Um, go ahead and read Acts 23, verse 3, real quick. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and the commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? Okay, so look, I put a lot of thought in this. It's, it's so easy to read scripture. Can you guys hear me good, by the way? Yeah, we got you. Okay, good. It's easy yeah. to read scripture. I've read this literally up until last night, a dozens of times. And there's so much stuff in the, in the fine print that we could overlook if we just kind of lazy read over the words. So I'm going to read it again. Verse three. Then said Paul unto him. Okay, this is to Ananias. Uh, to, uh, yeah, Ananias, chief priest. Paul said unto him, God shall smite thee. God, God basically will hit thee. Uh, thou whited wall, or they call it uh, whitewashed, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? You're going to judge me. You're going to break a law to tell me that I'm breaking a law. Mm. Right? And he says, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. Does anybody have any idea what that, what that means? And if you don't, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> um. So I'm going to have Alana read something I sent to her from Ezekiel chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. What's that? Whitewashed wall, white veneer, 
of purity covering over obvious corruption. Yeah, so we're going to, that's, we can go ahead and say that. Yeah. Basically, a white wall, when you imagine having a, having a, a foundation, let's say there's a wall and the wood's all rotten and you paint over it over and over, that's considered a whitewashed wall. The foundation is really not there, but it's a false presentation. Okay. So, but what does he mean? Why, why is this said in such a way where Paul says, God will smite you, uh, you whitewashed wall, basically. Well, to add more context to the way to what Paul's saying there, there's a very specific thing he's pointing out. Ezekiel chapter 12, it's actually 12, uh, 13, verses 1 through 12. Did I get it on there? Yes. Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 1 through 12 are going to help illuminate this. I'm going to quickly have Alana read it, uh, kind of speak up and read it to illuminate something that I want to point out about this verse in verse three. Okay. This is in the, Amplified this is the prophet Bible. Ezekiel. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel who prophesy and say to those who prophesy out of their own mind and heart, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and things they have not seen and have seen nothing. Mm -hmm. O oh, Israel, your prophets have been like foxes among ruins and is in, in waste places. You have not gone up into the gaps or pre, or breaches, nor built up the wall for the house of Israel that it might stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen falsehood and lying divination, saying the Lord says, but the Lord has not sent them. Yet they have hoped and made men to hope for the confirmation of their word. Okay, pause really quick. So just to keep you guys, by the way, hello, mother, just to keep you in the context, we're in verse three, but I want, she's reading from the prophet Ezekiel to give us a backstory, which we're about to get to in verse 12, that's going to make verse three, where it says thy whitewashed wall, and it's going to make it stand out a whole lot different here in just a second. So this is something that Paul would have known about from the prophet Ezekiel. So keep going. Verse seven. Have you not seen a false vision and have you not spoken a lying divination when you say the Lord says, although I have not spoken? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have spoken empty, false and delusive words and have seen lies. Therefore, behold, I am against you, says the Lord God, and my hand shall be against the prophets who see empty, false and delusive visions and who give lying prophecies. They shall not be in the secret council of my people, nor shall they be recorded in the register of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter into the land of Israel. And you shall know, understand, and realize that I am the Lord God. Verse 10. Hang on there. We're almost done. Because even because they have seduced my people, saying peace, when there is no peace, and because when one builds a flimsy wall, behold, these prophets daub it over with whitewash. Say to them with who daub it with whitewash that it shall fall. There shall be a downpour of rain, and you, O great hailstones, shall fall, and a violent wind shall tear apart the whitewashed flimsy wall. There it is. Verse, so, did we finish it up? Uh, yes. Yep. Verse 12. Behold, when the wall is fallen, will you not be asked, where is the coating with which you prophets daubed it? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind, in my wrath, and there shall be an overwhelming rain in my anger and great hailstones in wrath to destroy that wall. Okay, now it sounds like a lot of stuff. Basically, uh, I'm going to read one more verse. This is Matthew 23, verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. That's bad. For ye are like unto whited sepulchers. And it's kind of this idea of the whited walls, which indeed appear beautiful outward, covered up. Doesn't look like it's a, like it's a grave at all. Looks like life, but it's dead, right? They appear beautiful outward. Ooh, you appear beautiful outward, but guess what? It says, but are within full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanness. You're dead inside. You look like life, but you're dead inside. And so the reason I pointed out Matthew 23, 27 and Ezekiel 13, 1 through 13, is when you read, and I'm sorry to jump around so much, when you read Acts chapter 23, which is where we currently are, and at verse 3, and it says, uh, that Paul said to them, God will smite thee, thou whited wall. That is pointing them not just to God's gonna God's gonna cut you down, but it's gonna it's gonna cause their brain to revisit a very, 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 very important prophecy that they knew about. And that would have rang a whole lot deeper in their minds 
And that's the reason why he was cut loose so quickly. If he didn't have that context, he wouldn't know why they just let him go. Just because he said something to offend him, big deal. No, Paul reminded them of what, what scripture said. And that came from Ezekiel and from Matthew. So I thought that was really important. I don't know if you guys wanted to know that or not. Um, so the context of why that was such a big deal, that why did wall thing was a very strong subject for any good Jewish rabbi. That you don't mess around with. That's what Ezekiel was saying. You don't mess around with God because he will cut you down. So I just think that's really awesome. Um, Maybe in Acts 23, verse 3, if Paul's thinking about these verses, it's from, you know, I don't know. But go ahead and read verse 4 and 5 for me, though. All right. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest? Then said Paul, I wish not, brethren, that he was the high priest. For it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. Okay, so I made a little note here. Right there when it says, Then said Paul, I wish not, brethren. Now, Paul, I don't think Paul knew that he was the high priest, right? Um, re referring to verse 3. Uh, we talked about Ananias. I don't think he knew because it says, "Thou speak not, uh, thou not speak evil unto the ruler of thy people." Uh, Paul's been out of power now for for the circle with these people now for twenty years. Okay, he called them brethren, so he may not recognize some of them. I mean, maybe the maybe the priest changed and Paul didn't recognize him. Some say Paul had issues with his eyesight from the whole Damascus thing. Alicia even brought up maybe he had cataracts. We don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Some, saw, some say that Paul was just being sarcastic. So I don't know how to read the verse. I don't know if he was being sarcastic. I don't know. In verse five, the verse six says, but when Paul received that one part were said, now this is intelligent. You, you got to catch this. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other part Pharisees, he cried out in the council. In other words, he yelled loudly, men, brethren, I'm a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee in hope of the resurrection of the dead. I am called into question. <laughs> now, right there, Paul knew exactly what he's doing because he said, men, brethren. I love this right here. He says, the son of a Pharisee, that's me, of the hope of resurrection, meaning I believe in the resurrection just mm -hmm. like you Pharisees. But guess who doesn't believe in the resurrection? The Sadducees. <laughs> Look, I tell you, Paul was a very smart man. Paul was not afraid. Oh, yeah. We've mentioned that, but Paul knew that he had to, well, we find out that he's being told he'll go to Rome. And so he knew their beliefs were different. You know, we'll talk briefly about, so he re, he redirects their angers at each, to each other. And I'm going to read another verse and explain it a little deeper. So the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. I've told you guys that many times or angels or any of that kind of stuff. So a big fight ensued because of this. Because Paul saying, hey, like you, I believe in the resurrection, meaning the Pharisees. Uh-oh. Verse 7 says, and when he had said so said, there arose a dissension. There it goes. Between the Pharisees and Sadducees. And of course, this is where it all breaks up and Paul gets loose. And the multitude was divided. So instead of them all being against him, now they're against each other. It's smart. So I made a little note, in case anybody didn't catch this in the book of John. The Pharisees and Sadducees were two of the three groups within Judaism. Okay, you had Pharisees, Sadducees. But then in the, the New Testament, you hear the third group's the Essenes. Okay, the Essenes lived in a little desert community right, right by the Dead Sea, um, where they wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. They found them. There was a book. Uh, um, they were bookworms, so they were, they were in study all the time. And it was, they, were, they were all hidden away, and they'd hide out and, like, just get super well read. They were just really known for that. Um, they stayed in monasteries thinking they were all all their you know, what they did was the right stuff. They were very self-proclaimed, high and mighty, I guess you could say. The Essenes. In Jerusalem, uh in mainstream Judaism, there was the Pharisees, Sadducees. Those are the two we've heard about. Okay. They were between the testaments after the exile. That's the point. When Israelites were taken captive in Babylon for 70 years, they left Jerusalem on foreign soil. Meanwhile, the temple was burned. It had been burned. So there's no set. So there are no sacrifice, nothing, no, nowhere where you're able to make a sacrifice. And if you're a good Jew, you have to be able to sacrifice, you know, your lambs and, and go through all your Jewish practices. Well, after that revolt, they had nowhere to do that. Right. Because the temple, you know, was all destroyed. 
So they had to, we've talked about this, they had to get little groups of men together and it had to consist of at least 10 men and they call them synagogues. And so um, the priests cannot function without a synagogue. So they formed these little groups called synagogues. Um, and I just want to say that Sadducees did not believe in the Old Testament. So I just thought it was a fun fact. If you guys need it, I hope you can use it. <laughs> So verse, I'll go ahead and have a long <laughs> read. Um, so verse eight, we'll go ahead and read it again. Just, just keep reading. I think we're on seven. Oh, okay, yeah, go ahead. In verse seven, and when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say, there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Mm -hmm. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees part arose and strove saying we find no evil in this man but if a spirit or an angel has <laughs> spoken to him let us not fight against god well, isn't that interesting that the pharisee says we see no problem with him he believes in the resurrection mm -hmm. well, of course he's going to say that and so there arose a great cry and that means a great dissension um so the pharisees immediately take sides with paul and that that didn't work too well for the sadducees so verse 10 says then there arose a great dissension or a riot. There it goes again. The chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled into pieces, he was afraid he'd get tore apart. Once again, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force among them and to bring him into the castle. Well, here we go again. We got to save Paul. Just like the last chapter. So this could have been Paul's, really what we're about to read, right? Actually, what we just read could very likely, probably been Paul's lowest point in scripture. So I would say, if not one of the lowest points. And so, um, but something really special is about to happen. So we're gonna go ahead and have Alana read verse 23, 11, and we're gonna, I'm gonna read some side notes. And the night following the Lord stood by him and said, be of good, be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Hold on one second. Did y'all catch that? Jesus, right? Somehow, whatever. I don't know what form that was. But he says, be of good cheer, Paul. Notice by name, he personalized him. So if I go, Danny, hey, I love you, Danny. You're my friend, man. You ever, you ever notice if, uh, let's say you're talking to your lady and you, you get home from work and you say, hey, I love you, baby. Everything's cool, whatever, whatever, going about your night. Or you put your hand on her face and you say, hey, listen, Alana, Chris. Alicia, whoever it is, I love you. When you say somebody's name and you personalize it, mm -hmm. now that person knows they have your full attention. Mm -hmm. So in verse wow. 11, Jesus says, be of good cheer, Paul. Yeah. Right there, Paul. For as oh, thou yeah. hast testified of me, you testified of me. In the beginning of Acts chapter 22, you gave your defense, your apologetic. You testified of me. You weren't afraid to hide my name. If I say I'm married to that woman, or do I say I'm married to Alana? One is I'm not hiding her. The other one's I'm hiding her. But yeah. Jesus says, you ain't hiding me. Those are my words. Because you testify to me in Jerusalem, knowing they would kill you. So must thou bear witness also in Rome. I'm going to carry you to Rome. There it is. Mm -hmm. well, that's all Paul needed because when Paul got saved in Acts chapter 9, the first thing he said is, what you want me to do? And look at it here. When he says, Jesus says in verse 11, you're going to Rome. As soon as, as soon as Jesus said that, it didn't matter what anybody said to Paul. He was going to Rome. It didn't matter what you yeah. convinced him he was going to die. It didn't matter. Paul wasn't afraid of death. The only thing Paul feared was not honoring Jesus. God. All right. He, he knew he was going to Rome. That's the point. Jesus yeah. showed up, and he called him out by name, just like he did me, Danny. Just like he did me. And so there's a reference I made here. Romans, uh, go ahead and read. Do you mind reading these four verses in Romans for me in the blue? Romans 9.1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenant or the co covenants 
and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Yeah, so that's a reference I made. Um, I think uh, conscious bear what it's just it's it's this is just to show us um, that um, I had a point behind that. I lost my train of thought. But it ties into what we what we learned. I just lost my train of thought. What it was, I'll come back to I it. I think I think what you're it it kind of ties into the fact that this is a really low point in Paul's. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. He was really yeah. struggling in in the very spirit. good. But one thing I wanted to point out, I don't know if anyone he's, caught he's this, going through a hard time right now. This was, is as low as it's been in his most lowest point. This isn't the Holy Spirit that's talking to him. Jesus came in the like he physically saw him he said somehow it, glorified we don't know exactly how he stood next there. to him to comfort him read it again and he does that you know what else and the night following the lord stood by him yep you know what's the interesting night following the lord stood by him what alana just said is very interesting because there are five occasions that i know the lord stood with him in some form shape or matter i don't know how he did it i'm about to tell you where they are that's a very good word thank you Look, for Paul is sad because Israel's lost, number one. You can hear that in Romans. Basically, Romans 9.1, which he just read through 9.4. Paul's in a bad way, man. Jesus spoke to him, said, you're going to go to Rome. But Paul's having a hard time. He's willing to go through, actually literally go to hell so that his brothers don't. We talked about that last week. So Paul's having a real hard time. But from now until the book of Acts, to the end of the book of Acts, Paul will be in a Roman custody from now on. This is the last oh. time I see Jerusalem. He's going to be in Roman custody. But Jesus says, Paul, I have more for you. And so Paul basically received a Superman suit. Because Jesus said, they ain't taking you out. You're going to Rome. Isn't, isn't this also the point of where, because of that promise that was given to Paul, that he was going to go to Rome? That when yes. he becomes captured in the in the in the in the next few chapters again, he knows that this is not the end for himself Ooh. because that which was promised to Christ or that Christ promised him that he would go to Rome had not taken place yet. That's true. That's true. Y'all with us so far? Mm -hmm. And so uh Alan had mentioned that uh that, that somehow physically Jesus made himself known Damascus. We heard about that. I actually wrote down five occasions, Acts chapter nine. On the road to Damascus, Paul sees Jesus, right? He he in some form, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and um, Acts chapter sixteen, Troas there's a vision of a man and a Macedonian man. There, there's a Jesus is there. Acts eighteen, Paul's in Corinth. Remember he says, "Cheer up! I have people here in the city around you." Remember that? Mm -hmm. Acts twenty three, which is right here where we are, Paul's beaten the people in the city, and guess what? The second to last chapter in the book of Acts, he's shipwrecked. He's on a boat. Jesus shows up again. Yeah. So, man, Jesus personally sure makes an effort to show up face to face for Paul. He's, he, he really favors Paul. Yeah. And so, Paul is probably by this time went from feeling really bad to being really refreshed. And so, here's a brand new day, Acts 23, verse 12. Go ahead. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. Notice it's day. Nothing good happens at night. Oh. It's an hour, I think it is. So look, it's a brand new day. Verse 12. Remember that. It's a brand new day. Certain of the Jews banded together. So someone's out to get them. They bound themselves under a curse, right? Mm -hmm. But there's something good that happens, saying they would neither eat or drink. We will not eat, we will not drink until we kill Paul, period. And so I made a note of Lamentations 3.22. It says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. Verse 23 says, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Well, that sounds bad, verse 12, that these people, these Jews banded together to kill him. These dagger men, these private uh, assassins that we've heard about before. But this is a new day. Let's find out what happens. Verse 13. And they were more than 40, which had made this conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. I want you I want to take note. This is the jail that Peter was released from. Keep going. 
Now, therefore, ye with the council signified to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow as though we, ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him. And we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. So these men are called dagger men, like I told you. Okay. So Paul has woke up to a brand new day. We just talked about that. Not even knowing that 40 assassins are sent out to kill him. That's a bad day when you don't even know it, right? Well, it's, excuse me, it's not a bad day. Paul, think about, think of all the stuff that we manifest, that we we speak negativity. I'm giving uh -huh. them more night about negativity. Look, things could be going on in your life. Speak, man, speak a good day. Paul doesn't Amen. want to send her out to kill him. And so, <clears throat> yeah. Paul's woke up to a brand new day, not even aware of it. The 40th, think about it. Think about it. You wake up and you're like, you and me. Hey, me and you having a good day, and I have 40 people out to kill me, and you're all happy as could be, right? He don't know. God's, you know, I think God protects the innocent from having too much knowledge. Think about animals. They don't know what's going on. They're just happy. Right, yeah. Because we have all the awareness. You know, think about the garden. When when, when God, uh, when it was a tree of knowledge, uh, excuse me, the tree of uh, life and the tree of the knowledge of good, uh, good mm -hmm. and evil, mm -hmm. it's not that God kept evil from us. But he didn't want us to have them. He's free will, but he didn't want us to have the knowledge of evil. He didn't want yeah. that. But he yeah. makes it available because he's a God of free will. Right. So right yeah. here, Paul, I don't know if that really goes with this, but Paul, uh, he's just having a good day. God said, I'm going to Rome, even though 40 people are trying to kill you. And yeah. God's working in his behalf in the background. We're going to hear about it right here. Where did I leave off? No, uh, yeah. And so. They would secretly attack with daggers. The assassins wanted the chief priest um, to lie to the commander, the Roman commander, and pretend, implying that um, um, implying that they wanted another get together to set up an ambush. Yeah, the assassins are committed, but they're committed to the wrong purpose. Okay, there'd be a really good. They're really committed to what they're doing if they knew what they were doing was wrong. So they thought they were doing the right thing, but they weren't. And so, verse sixteen. Go ahead and read that for me. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he has a certain thing to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the chief captain and said, Paul, the prisoner called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee who has something to say unto thee. Then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, what is that thou hast to tell me? Okay, let me explain what just happened. So um, the dagger man, right? So it says in verse 16, and when Paul's sister, and there's the first, who's Paul's sister? Where'd she come from? Exactly. Yeah, who's that? Well, Paul's <laughs> sister's son, okay, who's that? His nephew, right? Like, uh, first, I've heard of this. Paul's sister's son. So now we know he has a sister and a, a nephew. And she, yeah. heard of their lying in wait, heard about them, you know, waiting heard about what was going on. And he went and entered into the castle and told Paul, this is his nephew, came and told Paul. So Paul's a sister and a nephew. Um, and by the way, if you make note of this, 1 Corinthians 7, 10, 1 Corinthians 9, uh, there's some other stuff that points to, uh, says Paul was single. Um, anyway, we'll get into that in just a minute. So Paul's sister's son heard about it. He went and entered into the castle and told Paul. So I'm going to read this other part, and then I'm going to go back to this. Verse 17 it says that then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, bring this young man unto the chief captain. Take him to the captain. For he has a certain thing he needs to tell him. He needs to tell him what he, what he heard. Paul, again, is defending himself. So he took him, brought him to the chief captain, so, and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me unto him. And prayed me to bring this young man unto thee and who has something to say to you. So Paul the prisoner had no crime committed. Um, and if we back up, I made a note here that um, I, saw, I said Paul and Jesus were both single according to scripture. Paul was a member of the Jewish council, not according to scripture, but Paul was a member of the Jewish council. One could not be single. Okay, let me say this where it's clear. I think a lot of people assume that Paul was single because we don't hear anything about a wife, but we do, but we know that we know this, that if you're a part of the Sanhedrin or a Jewish council, you have to be married. 
Okay. So Paul was a member of the council, so he could not be single. And also it was unthinkable to be righteous if you weren't married as a Sanhedrin leader. So we don't know who she is, but there's some other things in scripture, I think, that point very clearly to Paul being uh, one time a married man. That's what I'm thinking. So we don't know what happened to his wife. So there's no, I don't have any solid grounds on that, but just wanted to point that out. Um, so verse 19 says, then the chief captain took him by the hand and went with him aside privately and asked him, what do you have to tell me? So this is Claudius Lysias, the chief captain, right? He says, what do you have to tell me? So to recap, Paul's nephew tells Paul. Paul says to the, get the centurion, we, gotta, we must tell him. Paul tells the centurion, this young man must tell the commander. And then the commander took him by the hand. The reason I pointed those out is because all of these things that are written down are eyewitness accounts, just to help solidify scripture, man. All those statements are eyewitness statements. That's why I pointed them out. Verse 20 says, and he said, the Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou would bring down Paul tomorrow and the council as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly and ask more questions. And it says, but but do not thou yield unto them for their lying way for him of them more than 40 men, these dagger men, which have bound themselves with an oath. They swore they're not going to eat, drink, sleep, whatever, until they kill him. And they bound an oath that they will neither eat, drink. And I just said that not knowing I was going to say that. So they've killed him. And now they're ready, looking for a promise from me. So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him. See thou tell no, see thou Tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. Don't tell anyone that you've shown this to me. Okay? Go ahead and read verse 23. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready two hundred soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen three score and ten, and the spearmen two hundred, and the third hour of the night. So that's telling us. And he called, he called unto him two centurions. So this is two times 100 men, because each centurion had 100 men under them, right? He called unto them two centurions, Roman guards, make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea, and horsemen three score and 10, that's 70, three score and 10, and spearmen, which are javelin throwers, 200 at the third hour of the night, that's 9 p.m. So 9 p.m., basically we're going to have a total, if you add up the centurions, the 200, the 70, and the 200, the other 200, we're going to have 470 Roman soldiers guarding Paul. So think about this. They're trying to kill Paul. What's God do? He has 470 men guarding his saint. Wow. 470 men at the third hour at 9 p.m. God is exaggerating his faithfulness over Paul, sir, ma'am. That's how God is. If God says you're going to Rome, you're going to Rome. 470 months. Think about that. Javelin throwers at that. So these are people ready for war, ready for battle, willing to die to protect one man. Geez, I wonder if God had something to do with that. You ain't going to hurt my soldier. Yeah. Just remember that Caesarea was the seat of the Roman government in Judea, by the way. So this is a, this is a massive undertaking. And it was being done at night. And verse 24 says, and provide, the, listen to God, not only 470 men, but now provide them beasts, give them a ride that they may set Paul on, bring him safe unto Felix, the governor. Remember the story, the good Samaritan we're not going to go into when he gave the man, he lost his way and he, he fell among thieves and the, the good Samaritan showed up and put him on his own beast. And that was a picture yeah. of Jesus showing up and getting yeah. our yoke. And this is a picture of Jesus once again. Come on, yeah. Come on, man. And he says, uh, "I made a note here. Yeah, and keep him. Uh, bring him safe to Felix, the governor. Paul was brought uh, several mounts. He was brought in luxury, man. Four hundred seventy guards in luxury. Um, I made a note here. It reminds me of Jesus riding in on Revelation nineteen with many horses. I just thought about that. Jesus not only saves us, but he protects us. Not from all trouble, but he protects us. Verse twenty five. Go ahead." And he wrote a letter there after this manner, Claudius Lys Lysias, after the most excellent governor, Felix, sendeth greeting. 
this man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. And when I would have known the cause, wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth into their council. So he says, so that he's writing a letter. So here's God's intervening, right? So the Roman commander is writing to the governor. So Paul, here we go. Paul is making his way to Rome, man. It's getting better and better. He's getting closer and closer to all the world leaders and the kings. It's all coming down, man. The Roman commander is writing to the governor who will receive this letter. Um, and verse 26, Claudius, it says, Claudius Lysias, under the most excellent governor Felix, sending greeting. <clears throat> now, I don't really like any of these guys, but Claudius Lysias, by the way, Claudius is his Roman name. Lysias is his Greek name. Possibly named after the emperor. I don't know. Um, it says, this man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. Wrote this letter. Then came, came I with an army and rescued him having understood that he was a Roman. So listen, hey, I don't want any trouble. We know he's a Roman. We didn't hurt him. We kept him safe, right? And verse 20, it says, and when I would have known the cause, wherefore they accursed him, I brought him forth to their council. So he's defending himself. Verse 30 says, and when it was told me how that the Jews laid wait, these 40 men, for the men I sent straightway to thee. I did the right thing. This is a Roman man. And gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee that they had against him farewell. So I'm going to read one more verse and you can you can uh, take it over, okay? Mm -hmm. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris, which means like the father. Antipatris is a military outpost. It's a place of rest for travelers coming through. It was a natural stopping point that was built right along a little ridge, just a little ridge area between Caesarea on the water and Jerusalem. A little resting point, kind of like a truck stop. Go ahead, verse 33. Well, I have something to say real quick. Yes. Um, 30, back 32. 20, 29, where it said that um, had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. And it says, for Luke, this was the important line in the letter. It is possible that Roman officials reviewed the book of Acts before Paul's trial before Caesar. Here, Luke showed that other Roman officials had judged Paul not guilty. One of Luke's prime motives in writing his twofold history is to demonstrate that there is no substance in this charge of subversion brought not only against Paul, but against Christians in general. That competent and impartial judges had repeatedly confirmed the innocence of the Christian movement and the Christian missionaries in respect of Roman law. That's good. Okay, 32? Yes, 32. On the morrow, they left the horse, the horsemen to go with him and returned to the castle. That's the barracks. Who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. He's moving on. Keep going. Verse 34. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province... He was, and when he understood that he was of Sicilia, I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come, and he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. Okay, so this is obviously where this book closes out. It's a short chapter. So listen, between 34 and 35, so this is five years, Paul is as a prisoner, five years at this point, right? This begins a two-year confinement in Caesarea for Paul. So it's a total of five years. So in verse 35, it's two years in. This praetorium, we've heard about praetoriums earlier in the book of Acts in Rome. It says, I will hear thee, he said. In other words, I'll hear your case when thine accusers are also come. Because listen, uh, we're going to talk about accusers, but when somebody accuses you, they have to be present. Do you remember uh, all the way book back in the book of John that the woman that was fallen in adultery? Yeah. Remember yeah. her accusers weren't there? Right. In the eyes of two witnesses? Yep. Jesus said, hey, if one of you are innocent, who cast the first stone? You know that whole story. Right. Where were the people that accused her? Because they have to be present or the accusations thrown out. Yeah. yeah. And there were, hey, listen, and there was a trial that day because there were two witnesses, Jesus and the Father. Yeah. Come on now. Awesome. 
So you have to be careful in those days. You can get stoned for anything. You can't just blame somebody unless you have that person. So nowadays, when you when somebody says, hey, yeah, they said that about you, where are they at? You know, when somebody, they're gonna they're gonna trash talk you, but they won't show up to do it in your face, right? Mm-hmm. Listen, that's why in a court you notice when a courtroom you have the judge and you have the witnesses, right? The two mm-hmm. the witnesses, and then you have the accuser and the person being accused, but you can't have a person being accused without an accuser sitting on the other side of the room. Right. That's where we got our law. You have to be there. So verse 35, it says, and I will hear thee when thy accusers are also here when they come. Mm-hmm. And he commanded him uh, to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. And that's just um, um, his palace. That's his palace, right? So Paul made it to Caesarea. Forty assassins, they failed. And so that praetorium, that judgment hall is called a praetorium. That's the governor's judgment hall. That's what that is. I made a note, Acts chapter 9, verse 15. This is on the road to Damascus. But the Lord said unto him, this is Paul, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me. Wait, was that Paul? Uh, the Lord said to him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings. Did you hear that? I'm going to read it again. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. The little words we don't even realize in front of us. I'm going to read it again. But the Lord said to him, go thy way. This is back when it happened, when he lost his sight. For he is a chosen vessel. I'm going to read it again on purpose. Unto me, God said, this is a chosen vessel, back in Acts 9, to bear witness of my name before the Gentiles, which we already read about just recently. Here, here it is coming to pass. He bore witness to the Gentiles, right? And kings, which is what he's doing right now. So the word came to pass. God's word never returns void without a purpose. Y'all, hey, tomorrow night, I'm going to be preaching at Fairfield Christian Center, and the whole uh, message is about words. I cannot come on. To do this message, man. All right. I mean, we're gonna go all around the gamut with it. I wish we had it live. It says, "To bear my name before Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, the people of Israel." So Paul was told in Acts nine fifteen that he would preach to kings and Gentiles. And what's he doing right here in Acts twenty three? Well, this is the beginning of the fulfillment of the promise made to Paul mm-hmm. twenty years earlier. Yes. Every time God speaks, His word does not return void. He's meant. A better way to put it, God doesn't bite his tongue. No, no. He doesn't. His word never comes out. And we're going to, man, when a prayer comes out, when a word comes out, his word not returning void, what that means is God's words, if you speak his words and not our secular words, it will not be out in the open without a response by him. Like a good father, like, Daddy, you told me you're going to take me to the park. Yeah. Listen, God, Pastor James will tell you this. God wants you to hold him accountable. Yeah. He wants you to call him at his word. Say, Father, <laughs> just like James say, Daddy, you told me you're going to, your word says, when two or more gather, there you are in the midst. We'll call him at his word. When we say his words, it makes him happy because he can respond to, yeah, those are my words. I'll bless you. Say his word, pray his word, speak his word, preach his word. And so, Paul, man, you got to love Paul. Paul and Damascus stood up, did what he's supposed to do. Every time Jesus said, you're going to Rome. Okay. You know who else did that? Abraham. Abraham, yeah. he heard finally in Acts chapter uh, Genesis 12. No, I'm sorry, 22. He hears God say, go up to the mount, which I'll show you, Mount Moriah. First thing Abraham did finally in, in Genesis 22 was he got up early and went up the hill. Yeah. He did what he was told. Paul is a man after God's own heart. And so um, I think it's a beautiful story. I was going to go on and move to Acts 24 a little bit. Or uh, let me see how it starts off there. I think Paul's wonderful, man. I just do. Um, oh, the beast. I could, if you guys want, read a few verses of Acts 24. Or you want to wrap it up tonight? What do y'all think? Y'all want an early night? You want to go into 24 a little bit? What's the general consensus? Yeah, yeah, I got I got to shut it off here. Uh, uh, we'll wrap it. How about we wrap it up? Call it a clean break at Acts chapter twenty three. Yeah, that's fine. So I'll yeah. tell you this: uh, since we're done, basically next week's coming up. Uh, Paul is going to uh, after five days. Um, 
and some's going to have with Ananias. We're going to hear about a guy named Tertullus. Um, we're going to hear about a guy named Felix. None of these guys are any good. Uh, Paul's bound. Um, he's going to be. This, we're going to hear about the Nazarenes, and there, all kinds of stuff's going to happen. He's going to be tossed around because of rumors, just like before. And it's going to. I'm telling you, it gets worse. But then we're going to get to a shipwreck in 27, and Paul's going to die. So y'all hold on. It's going to be good. Well, before we get there, I'm going to. I'll I'll close out this, the end of this what we just read. Okay. Um, because I think this is really good. Yeah. Paul lived many years with great freedom and had to trust the promises of God through those years. Remember that the beginning of that promise fulfilled was spoken to him 20 years prior. So it says, yet he also had to trust the promises of Jesus in his years of little freedom and to know that God would work just as powerfully through those more difficult circumstances. Paul needed to receive the promises of Jesus, both promises from 20 years before and promises recently made to receive them with confident faith allowing those promises to make a difference in how he thought and even felt. Every believer must do the same. That's good. I like guess Guzik's notes. Mm -hmm. If you guys ever get a commentary, if you're into commentaries, man, you got to check out. I love Skip Heisig's commentaries, John Corson, but uh, David Guzik is one of the phenomenal commentaries he writes about every book, a phenomenal scholar, I, I believe. What I love about him is that he pulls from other Calvary. resources as well, and then he lists um, his resources yeah. and his own commentary. And what's really good is a lot of the guys I study, since we're done, uh, are from Calvary Chapel. And, you know, if anybody knows anything about Calvary from Costa Mesa, they made a movie called Jesus Revolution about Chuck Smith, the, the founder of Calvary. Uh, wow. his, his primary um, belief is that you should preach the whole counsel of God, meaning verse by verse. And so one of the Calvary, well, not one of, the main Calvary idea is that we preach the scripture verse by verse. And so there's other ways to do it, but David Guzik, along with Skip Heidzig, along with John Corson, and uh, the guy from the movie, Greg um, Laurie, and Chuck Smith, many others. I mean, there's lots of them. They come from Calvary Baptist. So Calvary Chapel. Calvary Chapel, I'm sorry. So if you guys want to have a good, anybody listening, if you want to do a good verse by verse teaching on the Bible, Usually any Calvary chapel is going to be, no one's perfect, but it's going to be Bible-based scripture verse by verse. And so what I like is, and I'll close here, is that when you're, when you're, when I give my commentary or my notes, my teaching, I'm getting it from people like these guys that get it from multiple other sources. So you're getting like a collection of probably a couple hundred people, minds, great minds, you know, being filtered through one person. And so the stuff we're talking about is, well researched so i think it's awesome to to learn from a good source but, uh, hey hey I, hey john yeah hey do you do you, do you ever you ever listen to uh john MacArthur, pastor john MacArthur? i do um, i mean he's uh, just a great. Satanist, but yeah i do yeah. Uh, so i've read a lot of his stuff i've listened to him many times uh, um, mm -hmm. Here's the thing I'll say. Uh, he definitely is convicted, and he just like Bodie yeah. Bachum, they're friends. Uh, yeah. Like John MacArthur's preaching. Now, there are some differences. He's a cessationist. He doesn't believe in the gifts of the Spirit, like, you know, those kind of things. So I don't line up with everything. Right. Yeah. Um, because yeah. we know Acts chapter one and two tell us the gifts of the Spirit are until the Lord comes back. So I don't okay. know how you leave that out. Yeah. So I do love John MacArthur's teaching, preaching. I love his commentary sets. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, we don't line up on all things, but most things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Bodie Bauckham's another one, man. You should check him out. Bodie Bauckham. Uh, yeah, I think I've heard of him. Yeah. B-O-O-D-I-E Bauckham. B-A-C-H-A-U-M. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. So. Praise out. Any other questions? James? Anybody? I'm good. All right, so here we go, Father. We just thank you for this time together tonight with our friends and family, with our kids. I have my, my daughter, my grandson around here tonight, and I'm, we're blessed to have um, all of you here with us that we could fellowship together, we could teach and preach and receive the word together as a, as a group, as a family. We love you. We thank you for this opportunity. Um, we just ask if anybody's going anywhere tonight, you keep them safe where they go and where they come from. Just keep them Keep them grounded. Keep them in your word. Keep them uh, covered. 
vascular hedge protection, uh, hedge protection. Father, we just thank you for this time tonight. And we ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you. I hope can see you guys again. You too. You too. I may be live. Maybe I may, if my wife is up to it, I may be Facebook living at seven o'clock tomorrow. Um, okay. If I do, it's going to be uh, something I've been preparing for a while on words. So it's a topical study. It's not verse by verse. Okay. But you don't really see me do that very often. So. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's going to be about words, and it is truckloaded full of stuff, man. Let me tell you. Oh, oh is that all right? All right. I bet it is. So if we're live, we'll see you at 7 p.m. tomorrow night. All right. Uh, well, you know, we got to uh, I'll be in service tomorrow. Yeah. Tomorrow that time. Yeah. yeah. I'll be in service tomorrow at that time. You're at that little Word of God church. <laughs> yeah, the little word of God. Yep, absolutely. Right, I love you guys. Hey, well, you know, the Bowling Campus is a small, small it is church. Smaller. It is smaller. Yep. Anyway, love you guys. Uh, love you too. Love you too. See y'all next With, week. Absolutely. Okay. Lord willing. Okay. Amen. God bless. Have all right. God bless you guys. Bye-bye.